get into all the time with companies <coughs> saying, oh, well, we're going to make lots of money based upon our guesses about what works. I think dig.com is one of the most famous examples of how to crash and burn with that idea. Some of you may remember them. Is that old in internet terms yet? I don't know. <coughs> so a basic A-B test works kind of like this. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of the details because I want to move ahead to the further stuff. Basically, you, your current behavior is what we tend to call the base. And then you have some new behavior you're going to try out that we call a variant. And you can have one or more vari uh, variants in an experiment. But for the purposes of this, we're just going to have one variant. It'll make things a lot simpler as we move along here. And you randomly assign customers to either the base, your original behavior, or the variant, the new behavior. And the question is, what can we actually test with A-B testing? Basically, anything which has a yes or a no. Did they click the Buy Now button or not? Did they sign up for the newsletter or not? Did they agree to receive spam from you or not? That's what A-B testing does, very much simple, you know, yes or no choices. So please keep that in mind when you're looking at in implementing A-B testing somewhere. So. And before we actually get into it, there's a little bit of marketing stuff we should talk about first so you understand how some of this works. So this is what we call a conversion funnel. Now, I've made up these numbers just to make the math really easy, but this is a very important concept with A-B testing. The idea is you get lots of customers seeing a thing, and then you get fewer and fewer customers each step of the way. In other words, you're funneling them down. And so let's say you've got a million people see your AdWords out on Google, for example. We assume 3% conversion each step. It's a made-up number. That means 30,000 people at 3% would have clicked your AdWords. For the Buy Now button, as part of your conversion funnel, we have 3% of 30,000. That puts you down to 900 people having clicked the Buy Now button. And then Shopping Cart, we only have 27 people who did not abandon their cart. And then finishing by giving you the magic number of their credit card number, 3%. We have one person down here. A 3% conversion every step. Now, to think about that, let's say it costs 10 cents per AdWords click. It just costs you 3,000 euro to get one customer. That's your total cost of ownership. They're actually, the total cost of ownership is a lot more because you actually had to build whatever it is that they're looking at. But that gives you an idea of how expensive it can be if you get your conversion funnel wrong. And so, generally, with A B testing, you stop, start at the top of the conversion funnel. Because you get a lot more people, you can get your results in faster. But we're, we're not going to go into that too much right now. Instead, we're going to look just at the Buy Now link. So uh, just out of curiosity, which one of those do you think will generate more clicks on a website? Blue. The blue? Blue? OK, anyone who said blue, you're wrong. Red. Does anyone else want to guess? <laughs> you, you said red? Red. Yeah, you're wrong, too. Both. The yellow ones. The reason why you're wrong is you have different customers, you have different products, you have different websites, you have people who just have different moods, and you don't know in advance which is going to work. I know a company which decided to try horizontal scroll bars as part of an A-B test on an e-commerce uh, e site. That's a horrible idea. They made a lot of money off of it. <laughs> I, I'm not going to go into details as to why, but you don't know in advance. So don't prejudge what is and is not going to work. So let's try this again, because this is real fun. So we have roughly 20,000 visitors in our experiment. We see a little over 10,000 on the red button, a little under 10,000 on the blue, 125 conversions on red, and 132 conversions on blue. Which one performed better? The blue. You said blue? I said blue. What's that? Blue, I said blue. OK, you said blue. Anyone else? Grant, the answer is we don't know yet, and I'll show you why. So we're going to try it again. Again, we've got roughly 20,000 visitors. We've got slightly more in blue this time. But now we have significantly more conversions in blue, 155 conversions versus the still 125 conversions over there. The problem we have, the reason why the first set of numbers didn't quite work out, but this one's working out a little bit better, is because, what, most of you can't do chi-square statistics math in your head? Well, <laughs> neither can I. I never remember it. <coughs> so. The way it works out, for the first set of numbers I gave you at what we call a 95% confidence level, that is the percent chance that the null hypothesis is void block. In other words, 95%, we're 95% comfortable if these numbers are correct, more or less. That's, if you know A-B testing, you know I'm kind of shuffling the, kind of ignoring some issues there. But basically, if you go out to this website right here, and this is up on SlideShare, by the way, 
Uh, you can download the spreadsheet used to generate this. One, these numbers are a little bit different because I made them easier to read. Two, they're a little bit different because I corrected the slight math error they made. But effectively, <coughs> at 95% confidence with the first set of numbers, we only have a 51% chance that blue's better. In other words, you're flipping a coin with the second set of numbers, at 95% confidence, we have a 94% chance that blue is outperforming red with those numbers. What that means is if you want to get a 99% confidence, this number is going to drop. If you want to be 99% sure that these numbers are right, then this might drop to something like 85% chance that it's better. Um, so this actually gives you the basic idea of how this works in A-B testing. We use statistics to analyze the numbers, to come up with percentages, to more or less say, we think this is going to perform better than that. But it doesn't tell us which actually sells more product. So please keep that in mind. If you start selling a lot more of a given product through A-B testing and you're like, yay, did you sell less of another product? It also doesn't tell us which one creates more profit. That's something else you have to pay attention to. So side effects, and there's all sorts of little knock-on effects. A-B testing really doesn't tell you about. For the most part, that's not an issue. If you apply A-B testing and you use it properly, you're going to be making a lot more money over the long run, assuming you have a viable business instead of a used food emporium or something like that. <clears throat> but there, those are things to keep in mind. So here's a question for you. Which confidence level is better? You want to be confident that these results are good. Is 99% better than 90%? Yeah. Does anyone have an opinion? Yeah. Okay, so I've asked a couple of trick questions so far. <laughs> that might be it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's just say that we're aiming for 99% confidence, but we know from the number of people we have in a particular experiment that that is going to adjust our total sales by about 10 euro a day. It takes a lot longer to get to 99% confidence in something because you need a lot more traffic. For 10 euro a day, you don't care. You're wasting time going for 99% confidence. Whereas if you feel comfortable like uh, a visual website optimizer has a default 80% confidence level in their results, if you're going to be shifting your revenue by 100,000 euro a day, I would not feel comfortable with an 80% confidence level. So your confidence level is going to be directly tied into um, you know, the monetization and possibly other factors. So don't just say, this is a particular confidence level we have to have, and stick with that. How am I doing on time, by the way? Oh, great, great. Thanks. Okay. I didn't think I was having too much trouble. Oh. I'm going to talk a little bit slower. <laughs> So here's how it works. This is the vicious life cycle of A-B testing. And it never, ever, ever stops if you're doing it correctly. Up here, you create an experiment. Red buttons versus blue buttons. No thumbnails versus some thumbnails. Small thumbnails versus large thumbnails. Green versus pink font. Plink tags versus non-blink tags, whatever. You create your experiments. You then roll the dice every single time a customer comes to see which version they're going to hit. You track their performance over time, and then you choose the best one. Pretty simple. Now let me go into some detail on these steps first of all. This, this is the core of baby testing, which most people learn about. When you're doing experiments, you only want one difference per experiment. If you have this button and that button, and there's seven differences, you know, maybe the size, the font, the color, whatever, and you see a difference in behavior, you don't know which difference actually caused that difference in behavior. Does that make sense? Yeah. So only one difference per experiment, or per variant. You can actually have several variants, but again, it should only be one thing that you're testing on differences. You, so if you have a red button, you can try a blue button, a gray button, a white button, whatever, in the same experiment. If you want to try a larger size button, that would be a different experiment. And because those experiments might conflict, you probably don't want to run them at the same time. Uh, having people who know A-B te A -B testing to watch your entire A-B testing to look for conflicting experiments. One person tries larger thumbnails, another person tries removing thumbnails. Running those at the same time would not be very effective. So only one difference per version in order to control what you're actually, what differences you have. And then you roll the dice. When a customer comes to your website, 
you choose whether or not they're eligible for the experiment. That's a key thing. Many people roll the dice and then they decide whether or not someone's eligible for the experiment, but they wind up tracking people in their statistics who are not eligible for the experiment. For example, let's say you want to show a, a special promo for all the customers on your site who have spent more than 10,000 euro last year. And let's say that's only 1% of your customers. If you put all of your customers in this experiment, but then, you, uh, but then you're only showing this uh, amount, this special promo in the experiment to that 1% who's eligible for it, you actually, if you did the math, you wind up having 99.5% of the people not seeing that variant and only 5% seeing it. As it turns out, this is statistically valid, but it will take you much longer to get results on this. So instead, you only want to, you want to choose whether or not customers are eligible for the test. Are they in the top 1%? And then you roll the dice to see whether or, not, whether or not they're going to be tracked, whether they're going to be in the base of the variant. You only track the customers who are eligible. <clears throat> Statistics, we're not going to go into this. There are a number of different ways you can track this. There are a number of excellent tools out there available for tracking this, particularly uh, some programming languages actually have tools available for you. I've started writing one myself. I'm not releasing it yet because the interface is bad and it will make your life worse. So we'll get around to it someday. And then you choose the best afterwards. You, you create your experiment, you roll the dice to see which version they're going to see. You track their performance over the time. You then choose which one performs best. Patience is very, very important here. Many people get impatient right at the beginning and they screw things up. And then you create a new experiment, you wash, rinse, repeat. Just keep going through this over and over again. And <clears throat> at this point, you know 99.9% .9 of what everyone else knows about A-B testing but there's a lot more issues involved. So before I go any further, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so for example, you create like a new experience and like you go again and again. But if we take the example of a button, for example, you might choose um, like, um, like the red button is the best one, but then if you like, create a new experience with a bigger button, you'll see like there's less users using the big button because like they don't like big red buttons. Mm -hmm. And it would be a, a good idea to have a small a blue button. But like, if you create more space, like uh, your number of dimensions, like search dimension will increase every time. So and it, it does make it harder to figure out what's going to be best. What happens is over time, okay. as you're, um, sort of I'm sorry, you might just like choose an, an experience, but after like another stage, you probably want it to go uh, like for more different. That's yes. not me, is it? No. no. Okay, I didn't think so. I got embarrassed my last talk with that. So, <coughs> could you go back into previous experiences? What happens for many companies uh, that I've seen is when they have a previous experiment, like a red blue button experiment, and then they decide to flip the switch and let blue be the permanent behavior, what they will often do is leave that experiment in there. And, and then months later, if they've decided to change something in that area, they might rerun previous experiments okay. just to see how it impacts things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Anyone else before I go on? Okay. So when we talk about uh, choosing the best, this is something which a lot of people, this is where they screw up right off the bat. First of all, many times people forget to ignore the first business day, they're running a new experiment, they're getting a lot of traffic, and they're getting really excited because their variant is pulling in a lot more money. You get a lot of random fluctuation, particularly at the beginning of a test. Don't get overly excited. In fact, it's, there are some A-B testing tools which will not allow you to view the results until you have enough results in just so you don't get screwed up. Now that can also be problematic because if the results on one variant are zero conversion all the way across because you have a bug, then you'd like to know something like that. Or if something else goes disastrously wrong, you would like to know something like that. Um, I recommend running every A-B test at least a full business cycle. So let's say your business cycle lasts about a week and you launched your test on a Monday and by Thursday afternoon, the new version is statistically, uh, statistically significantly better than the old version, and you're like, great, we're coming to the weekend, we're going to get all these extra sales, let's go ahead and use the new version. You're getting impatient, and you're going to screw up. Because what happens is, behavior of customers over your weekend, for your full business cycle of last week, might be significantly different. These might no longer be people who are just browsing your site from their work computer when they're not allowed to. 
These might be people at home, sipping their whiskey, looking at your site, buying whatever it is you're offering when they sip whiskey. I don't know, that's a rough example there. And their behavior might be significantly different. So you let this progress over a full business cycle just to see how it performs. So that you don't miss some unusual behavior which is likely to happen on a Sunday night or something like that. <clears throat> what if you're wrong? You're going to be wrong occasionally with A-B tests. Remember, these are confidence levels. We're 95% confident that this is actually going to improve things. Uh, don't stress about it. <clears throat> if you do it properly, most of the time, you will get it right. We make mistakes all the time, every day, and we already know that. Yes? A business cycle is however your business is set up. Um, your business might not have cycles, but basically, if you have a pattern of customer behavior, like maybe your traffic peaks uh, every Thursday, uh, and then you know, or every other Thursday, or you know, something like that, then you let it run like that. Now, this this is kind of problematic having it run over a full business cycle because if you're a tax accountant in the United States, your business is peaking around April of every year, and having an A/B test running for an entire year may not be appropriate. But it just depends on how, does that help explain what a business cycle is? Okay. Also be very wary of uh, false positives. There's an excellent blog entry uh, by Matt Arneson. He's from, uh, he's from booking.com. He's worked with them for a long time. Uh, he actually has some Perl software in there. That's the only Perl you might come close to seeing in this presentation. Where, <clears throat> where he shows how you can run a bunch of experiments which you know, the base and the variant are equal, but one of them might be statist statistically significantly better than the other if you don't run it for long enough. Because it is possible you'll have random fluctuations early on in your testing before you should be significant, which are enough to throw it into significance. And you might get a false positive and say, oh, we've got something which is better than the old version, so let's go ahead and pull the trigger, but you don't yet know. So. The trick behind this is when you're starting out, he actually links to another blog post which is a little bit more in depth and explains how to work this out. When you're running an experiment, you decide beforehand, we need this number of customers before we feel comfortable saying that this is statistically significant. And even if it becomes significant before that, you ignore it. And you wait until it runs the full run, at least the full business cycle, to the minimum number of customers that you said has to be in that experiment. Does that make sense? Yes. That the, that the thing could fluctuate in and out of statistical significance over any period of time? Yes, but the longer it runs, so if I flip a coin ten times, you're not going to be surprised if it comes up heads seven times. If I flip it a hundred times and it comes up heads 70 times, yeah. something's probably wrong. If I do it a thousand times, you know something's wrong. So the longer the experiment runs, the more likely it is those fluctuations are just going to randomly even out unless there is something, it will settle down to its correct behavior. Does that make sense? So again, it comes down to setting an arbitrary boundary when you're happy with it. No, it's not setting an arbitrary boundary. Like I said, uh, he linked to another post uh, by a gentleman whose name escapes me. It does a lot of A-B testing. He's very good at it. And he shows a mathematical formula you can use to calculate the number of visitors you need to have for a particular test to feel comfortable with it being statistically significant and being meaningfully statistically significant. And boy, does that phrase make you feel uncomfortable or what? <laughs> so anything else before I go on? OK. So there are some limitations in A-B testing that people don't think about. Just because customers prefer the red button, you don't know why. A-B testing will never tell you why. Your expertise at this point is no longer required for picking something that's going to be better, for saying, I think a three-column layout is better than a two-column layout. Your expertise is for interpreting the results of what your customers say is actually better. You don't say what's better anymore. Your customers do. And that's what you want, because we need to be more focused on customers. We don't talk about that often enough. Side effects. Um, you could have side effects in A-B testing that you're not aware of. Uh, you might have this beautiful new system for you know, pulling all of this extra data out of a, you know, your NoSQL system to append it to search results. So if they're in the experiment and they're looking to buy red shoes, that they'll get some accessories going along with that. It might be they only see one difference there, but you also have this load overhead of hitting your NoSQL system that might have other side effects on your system that A-B testing is not going to show you. So 
it's not a fire and forget sort of solution. You do need to think about what's going on with A-B testing. Uh, it also doesn't tell you anything about your customer loyalty over time. You might do a great job of you know, driving your traffic and improving how everything's going. And your customers, however, may be unhappy. If you've increased your sales dramatically, but your customer service is awful, this could backfire. Does that make sense? Okay. How much time do I have left? I'm at 40, right? It's 27. Okay. I'm sorry? It's 10.55, so you have uh, 25, 27 minutes. I have what? Minutes? Seven minutes. Oh, seven minutes. Okay. No, 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 what they've done is they've built a tool which the masses can actually use, and it's fairly simple. There are limitations in their tool. They're aware of the limitations. It's hard to get those limitations across to the people using the tool. Um, but there's many other options out there. But basically, on some of the case studies they have on their site, and you'll find these case studies all over the web. You know, Honda talks about a 62% increase in test drives. Uh, that will dramatically lead to an increase in car buy buying. I know I used to sell cars. Don't hate me too much, please. Uh, <coughs> artsy editor, 40% increase in click-throughs. Um, you need a budget, 85% increase in downloads. And there's all sorts of things you can actually test. And these are some of the things they tested in these case studies that we're talking about. You know, add to cart button placement, uh, call to action buttons, pop-up forms, all sorts of things. Uh, one of my favorite was they removed a sign-up form for a newsletter and got a statistically significant increase in the number of newsletter signups. <laughs> Yeah, it actually worked. Basically, instead of having to sign a form, they just had a, for the newsletter, they had a paragraph describing, this is why you want to sign up for our newsletter. And it worked. So getting started. How do you get started in Navy testing? There's one thing a lot of people wonder about. Do you want to go with a vendor solution, or do you want to go with an in-house solution? Up front, I would recommend most people go with a vendor solution, Visual Website Optimizer, uh, Google, if they stop shifting around their products all the time, uh, because they got rid of theirs and they've now baked that into their, uh, their AdSense thing. Uh, there's Optimizely, there's a number of others. Basically, they're quick and easy to get started with just so you can get a feel for how this works. If you're going to spend forever and a day building your own in-house system, uh, you might not get started in A-B testing, or you might do it wrong, which is bad. I gave this presentation to a company in Paris, and as soon as the presentation was done, they shut down their A-B testing system because they'd been screwing up their results all that time. So I like a vendor solution at first. Once you know it, once you feel comfortable with it, then rolling your own in-house system is great. Once you do that, going for quick wins <coughs> is important. The obvious stuff at the top of your conversion funnel, whether you'll get more traffic, you can get results faster. Changing the size of your headlines, removing your headlines, whatever you want to do, but stuff, uh, making your pricing information more visible. Start brainstorming things you can change. This really frees you up when you're doing A-B testing because now instead of, no, those links have to be in that order, why not try? You get a lot more freedom to try stuff that you've never tried before. <clears throat> also, run an AA test. This is really important. A lot of people forget about this. Uh, running an AA test is where you have the base and the variant, exact same behavior. And you watch this over time, this will A, it will show you how you will get those statistically significant fluctuations from time to time, but B, it will, maybe I shouldn't have used A and B for these examples, uh, but B, it will also show you after a while, if you continuously have 60% and 40% in one group or the other, if the split's not even, or if they're behaving differently, 3.2% conversion in one, 3% conversion in the other over a few months, you know there's a problem with your A-B testing setup. So running an AA test where both sides need to perform the same over time tells you a lot about how your A-B testing setup is working. The business cycle depends on your business. <coughs> yeah, but if you run an AA test, then you can see when the fluctuation is sort of even, and when there's, it's not statistically significantly different. Um, well, I've seen people complain about AA testing because they said, well, this shows the entire thing's broken because we obviously had, you know, horribly skewed distributions of people and behavior, and, you know, we shut it down pretty quickly. Shut it down pretty quickly was a big red herring, or a big, you know, warning sign. 
you do need to let AA tests run for a while because you will have random fluctuations of people. I mean, I roll, you know, I flip a coin ten times, it might come up seven heads seven of those times. And that, that can happen a lot. That can happen repeatedly. So you, you need to understand what your company's business cycle is. This is understanding how your business comes in, the flow of traffic, uh, what your revenue is, you know, does your revenue peak at a particular period of time? Is it a week? Is it every two weeks? Uh, you know, for pay bi-weekly payroll processing firms, it might be two weeks. Monthly processing, you know, it might be a month. <clears throat> it might be that your business cycle is a day. And you just get lots and lots of traffic, except when the sun's over the Pacific or something like that. So I can't tell you what your business cycle is, but you do need to let the AA test run for at least a business cycle. And in fact, for that one, probably longer because it's not hurting anything, because there's no difference in behavior with those. So let those run for a long time, fire them off. Uh, I know one company which actually runs AAAA tests, <laughs> just because they like to make sure their own internal systems are working fine. And those take even longer to run, because the more variants you have, the more you split. If you have a thousand people, if you only have two variants, you've got 500 in each, you can get closer to significance. If you have four variants, you know, the base and three variants, then you have 250 people in each, you know, just harder to get to statistically significant conclusions after a while. So being patient is a key component of this. Yes? Can you run multiple experiments at the same time? Yes. The trick, the question was, can you run multiple experiments at the same time? Yes, you can. What you need to do is you need to be aware of whether or not those experiments are going to conflict. Um, if you have someone who is modifying the CSS to change the font, and someone else is running a different experiment to modify the CSS to change the font, and they don't realize that they're running conflicting experiment, then you want to have someone overseeing all the experiments looking at them. Uh, the example I always give is someone who's trying to make the thumbnails larger and another person trying to remove the thumbnails. That's a problem. Uh, but if you're working in different groups, you may not be aware of that. Hopefully, people should be restricted to the area that they're working on. So, like, one of the back-end devs isn't going to be working on the thumbnail stuff, but you never know. The AA test, in theory, cannot conflict with anything because there's no change in behavior. Absolutely not. Next. Anything? Before I go on? Okay, big problem with A B testing. <laughs> oh, this one happens a lot. There's a really interesting blog entry by a, a designer, a well known designer. He went to Google and he got really ticked off uh, that he had to A B test everything. There was one time when uh, they were testing 50 shades of blue or. <laughs> <laughs> over 60 shades of blue. That came so over 60 shades of blue on their website just to find out what was better. And he was getting frustrated. Thank you. Because he wanted to do a better job of designing, making pretty things. And Google said, yeah, that's nice. We want to do a better job of selling products because we're a company. Uh, particularly if you're a smaller shop, you want to pay your rent or you want to pay your mortgage or you, you want to not go bankrupt. It is nice to get in the trap of saying, I know this is going to be better, but you find out that it's not. So when I first started doing A-B testing, one of the very first tests that I ran, I was looking through our code base, and under a particular condition, the search engine threw away all search results. Well, that's a bug. It was very clearly a bug. It was not documented. I went back to the, you know, the source control logs. There was nothing in there. Clearly a bug. Okay, someone screwed up. But you know, as a general rule, I don't just, when I'm doing A-B testing, I don't just fix bugs and push them out there. I wrap the bugs in an A-B test, and then I push them out there. Because just because some behavior is buggy doesn't mean that it's going to adversely impact your customers. So I wrap this up in an A-B test, push it out there. The new behavior was manifestly better, in my opinion, because you weren't throwing away search results, and it performed much worse. So this was simply an undocumented feature, where it looked like a bug, but in fact, we did want to throw away the search results, and for some reason, someone in the past found out they were going to perform better by throwing away this data, but they forgot to mention it in the code or in any of the source control commits, which was very frustrating. But I was convinced that I was right. I knew it was a bug. I was wrong. Other people come in, no, a three-column layout is much better than a two-column layout. What are you doing? I have been doing this for 10 years. You don't care about that. And in fact, that's the sort of thing you have to work around, because what you want to say is, no, we're going to try a two and three-column layout. Design arguments go away because you try everything. Because you find out what your customers respond to better. That's what you want to do. <laughs> the expertise comes in in evaluating the results afterwards because A-B testing can't tell you why, 
you need the experts in their field to kind of guess and figure out why. All sorts of interesting problems with A-B testing you can get into. Forgetting caching, that's one of my favorites. Red and blue buttons. You've rolled the dice. Oh, we're going to show the blue button to this person. But you've cached the red button. <laughs> yeah, that, that can uh, really destroy your results pretty quickly. Non-random selection. Oh, we're going to put new users in one group and returning users in another group. Or men in one group, women in another group. No, no, no. That's not statistically valid. You need to randomly assign people to the different groups. What you can do beforehand is choose whether or not they're eligible for an experiment, but once you've decided whether or not they're eligible, randomly assign them to one of the groups. <clears throat> Forgetting the selection, if the first time they come back and see the first time they come to your site, they see the blue button, every time they come back, they need to see the blue button. Don't start switching back and forth all the time. Don't forget to cast the behavior because you won't know how it actually impacted them. So the company in Paris I was uh, giving this to, that's what actually destroyed their A-B testing system. They actually had everything else right, but they forgot to save the customer's, uh, the customer's preference, or the customer's experiment, what they were actually going to see. So they kept randomly showing results to people. <coughs> Dead code is an interesting problem. I've seen this a lot. You'll go into a code base, and there's an experiment from three years ago, which is probably no longer valid, and it clutters up your system after a while. So this is a frustration you need to be aware of, but I'm not going to talk about that much. And I mentioned earlier the profits versus, versus conversion. Just because you're selling more stuff doesn't mean you're profiting more. A-B testing is not a silver bullet, but it is a pretty darn good one. So most experiments fail. They fail badly. Uh, at the beginning, you often get a number of quick wins. But after a while, after the quick, obvious wins go away and you're starting to do micro-testing on smaller things, what you're going to see is, you know, here's your baseline, and oh, fail, we'll lose a little bit of money, or fail, we'll lose a little bit of money, or fail, we lose a little bit of money. You throw all those away. So instead of being down here, you're here, and every once in a while when you get one which improves it, well, you keep that, and now you've just bumped it up a little bit. Fail, 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 throw those away, oh, found one which helps. And you just keep gradually increasing how you're doing so most of them will fail. Do not get discouraged by that. Um, it was actually quite a blow to my ego at first, when I first started doing this, because all these ideas that I knew were going to be great sucked. <laughs> so <clears throat> it taught me pretty quickly the value of my expertise. Uh, don't roll the dice prematurely. This is the thing I mentioned before. If you have a million customers coming into your website and only 1% of them are eligible for an experiment, don't put all million in there. Decide if they're eligible for the experiment and only take that 1% who are eligible, then you roll the then you track them and roll the dice and figure out which version they're going to be in. Maybe test your bugs. That's when I mentioned that bug I saw in the search engine where it was throwing away results and it turned out that bug was not a bug. Or there's a, a recent case study I just read where on a conversion page where people are actually going to spend money, they removed the Facebook and other social media like buttons and they got a significant rise in conversion. Now, that follows a general rule that once you get down to the point of buying, you don't want to distract them with other things to think about. We already know that. But do not try and replicate other people's A-B tests on your site because your customer's behavior will be different. Test stupid ideas. Like I said, I know one company, they tested a horizontal scroll bar, and it worked brilliantly. Uh, they were shocked. In fact, one of their developers was so upset at the horizontal scroll bar, he just kept revisiting and revisiting. This is where expertise comes in. And what he saw after a while, there was actually a side effect of the horizontal scroll bar that hadn't been noticed before. So he reverted back to a vertical scroll bar, kept the side effect, and increased the revenue again. So don't be afraid to test the stupid ideas. You know, if they crash and burn, you'll find out pretty quickly. Also, don't require rollouts for this. You need to have an A-B testing control panel. So instead of rolling out a new version of the code to implement an A-B test, you roll out the A-B test, and then in your control panel, you can say, turn this test on or off. That makes it much, much easier in case the test goes disastrously wrong. Are yes? there any Perl control panels or whatever? What's that? Are there any control panels in Perl? There's a company I'm working with in the US who's considering open sourcing theirs. But it needs a lot of work. And I don't know if that's going to get pushed forward. Um, so I, I've seen this for like, you know, Ruby's got one which integrates with Rails. Uh, they're, I'm pretty sure they have them for Python. Uh, I don't know why the Perl community has kind of dropped the ball in this, but I think that's because we're, we're a little bit obsessed with regular software testing and not as focused on our customers, which I think is disappointing. So, and like I said, I'm <coughs> working on some which just calculates the statistics, but 
it turned out to the numbers right, the interface sucked, so it's not coming out yet. So you'll have to wait. Um, how do you select stupid ideas because making your phone 20 points bigger? Oh, so if, if you're wondering about how to select stupid ideas, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't stress about that. Basically, people just come up with ideas all the time. Particularly when you get into the idea of A-B testing, what happens is you now have the freedom to think about stuff. So, when JJ was talking about uh, writing, you know, there's always a question for writers, where do you get ideas? Well, back when I was writing screenplays, I was coming up with a screenplay idea every day, and I always thought these were brilliant. They weren't, but I, that's what I was coming up with, and I was able to do that because I got in the habit. And that's what happens with a lot of writers. They start coming up with these ideas because they get used to having the ideas. People who write jokes, they come up with more jokes because they're used to writing jokes. Once you get used to writing A-B tests, the ideas for experiments will start to float. But you have to start getting into that mindset. So segmentation, uh, I've only got a couple minutes left. Uh, here's some things to think about. Um, so new and returning customers often behave radically differently. So in fact, some people will not expose A-B tests to new customers. They'll say A-B tests are only for returning customers. I think it's a mistake, but keep that in mind. Different browsers can be important. You might have like a 5% across the board increase in conversion, and you're pretty happy with that. But then when you look at your browsers, you discover, oh, IE8 isn't working terribly well. And IE8 might actually be an important segment of your customers because older versions of IE tend to be older people who are often retired, don't upgrade their systems, often have more money to spend. So as a result, those little niche areas of your market might actually be a little bit more important to you. Um, so accept language can be important. If you have this product called Enterprise Star, and you want to test, should I call it Enterprise Nova? And that works marvelously well. And then you look at your accept language and you find out that Nova doesn't fly terribly well in Spanish. Nova, it doesn't run or it doesn't go. So that's the sort of thing that you uh, can easily miss if you're just looking at the big picture. Time of day, people might behave differently at different times of day. So do I have different behavior for my product at different times of the day? These sort of things you can start thinking about. IP country, gender, age, whatever. Segmentation is done after you've randomly rolled the dice and you're watching people for a while. So just looking at the different market profiles and what you're dealing with. You also want to see this, this great blog post, uh, fairly simple, explaining something called the multi-arm bandit. I want to do a little bit more research into this. Basically, the multi-arm bandit is kind of like heavy testing, but it does all of it for you. You put all of your variants into the multi-arm bandit for a particular thing, and as it runs along, it will automatically calculate what works best and automatically show that for you. So it's much, much nicer. Uh, so lots of money lying on the table. Ego's really bad. Data's really good. I'm out of time. Customer behavior trumps expert opinion. I don't care how good you are. If customers don't respond, forget it. And customer behavior, of course, trumps code behavior. Perfect code doesn't matter if customers do not use it. Uh, and like I said, this is out on slideshare.net slash Ovid. So I believe I'm done and I ran out of time. So yes, but one quick, do I have time for a quick question? One minute. From okay. Sorry. Are there things which shouldn't or which can't be tested? Like you said, graphics test graphics stuff and this and layout and whatever. But do you know of stuff which doesn't make sense to test? <laughs> um, Stuff that's not making you any money that you don't care about, you know, your FAQ page, you know, how is it going to fit into a conversion funnel? Anything which doesn't have a yes or no response to it? Anything else? Okay, if you have any other questions, you can ask me about it later. Thank you.